One of the things we alluded to in our, one of our previous videos is that the rational numbers do not actually cover the entire set of things that we'd like to think of as real numbers. Um, we said that there are holes in it, that there are certain numbers that you can't actually represent with a rational number, numbers that you might be able to measure on a ruler, for example. Um, so we didn't really provide much justification for this yet. So by means of that, we're going to show that there is no, for example, rational number that is equal to the square root of 2. Or in other words, there is no rational number that when you square it will give you 2. So we can state this as a theorem. There is no rational number whose square is 2. Now to prove this directly, we would have to examine every rational number and show that none of them could be squared to give us 2 somehow. And that's actually quite difficult. So for this particular theorem, we're going to attack it by contradiction. We're going to assume that there is such a rational number and then see if we can derive something contradictory or an absurdity from this. So we'll assume... I suppose we start by saying proof. Assume such a number exists. And we'll call it P over Q exists. Now, it's a little bit tricky because rational numbers are a little bit quirky in that you can have the same rational number being represented by different integers. So for example, two-thirds is also at four-sixths or six-ninths or negative two over negative three. So what we're going to do is we're going to also assume that we are in the lowest possible form of that rational number. And that is to say precisely that the numerator and the denominator have no common factors. They've been cancelled out. And moreover, that P and Q have no common factors. So that's about all we can say about that. So let's just start working on it. So we've assumed that such a number exists. That means that P over Q squared is equal to 2. Right. Now we're going to just work on this a little bit just to rearrange it into a slightly more convenient form. So I will expand out the square. So P squared over Q squared is equal to 2. And then I'll just rewrite this as P squared is equal to 2 Q squared. These are if and only ifs because Q is not 0 because it's a rational number. P over Q is a rational number. Okay, so we've rearranged this into a slightly suggestive form. And if we think about it for a second, this statement here is telling us something about what P and Q can be. So P squared is equal to 2 Q squared. What that means is that P squared is, in fact, an even number. Because it's 2 times something. And if a square is even, that means the number itself must be even. Think about that for a second. If you square any odd number, you get another odd number back. So this actually implies that P itself is an even number. So this implies that P squared, and hence P, is even. So we now have some new information about P, and we should try and incorporate that down as a mathematical statement somehow. So we'll say that P is equal to 2 times some other integer, M. And we'll substitute that back into our expression um, just here. So substituting back in, we get, so p squared is going to become 4m squared equals 2q squared, which can be re rewritten as 2m squared is equal to q squared. Now, that looks very much like what we just had with p and q. So comparing those two boxes, we can uh, apply the same reasoning a second time, 
and we can deduce that Q must in fact be even also. So by the same reasoning, Q is also even. So therefore, P and Q are both even. Now that's actually problematic, because if P and Q are both even, they share a common factor of 2. And right at the start, we built into our assumptions that P and Q have no common factors. So we've actually derived the contradiction. If we have it that P and Q squared must equal 2, then it's necessarily true that P and Q are both even numbers, as we just derived. And that contradicts our assumption, well, our statement that P and Q have no common factors. We just chose the lowest representative of the equivalence class of rational numbers there. So P and Q are both even, contradicting, contradicting our assumption that they have no common factors. So we've assumed the negation of our theorem. We have derived an absurdity or a contradiction, if you like, and therefore our theorem is true. is proven. And we can finish it off with a nice little coloured in white. Okay, so now that we've established that um, there are numbers that cannot be represented by rational numbers, we need to come up with a kind of working definition of what the real numbers should be. Now it turns out that in fact we can, just, we can construct the real numbers directly from the rationals, but this is kind of beyond the scope of this course, so we're not going to. What we're going to do instead is we're going to assume that our real numbers are an extension of the rationals. Okay, well that makes sense. It's the rational numbers with some extras. Um, that the real numbers are an ordered field in exactly the same way that the rationals are, as we talked about previously. Uh, containing the rationals as a subfield. Okay, this all makes sense, and so we can use inequalities, etc., as we kind of cavalierly talked about in previous videos without really talking about what the real numbers were, um, as previously discussed. So all of everything we talked about, about ordering, inequalities, all that kind of thing carries over into the real numbers. And in fact, we can get to the real numbers by adding a certain axiom um, to our, um, to our, our, what we had previously. So this is called the axiom of completeness or the least upper bound property. And the statement says, every non-empty set of real numbers that is bounded above has a least upper bound. Now we haven't really talked about or defined what bounded and upper bounds and that kind of thing mean yet, so we'll get onto that in the next video. But for now it suffices to say that this axiom um, characterizes the real numbers. Um, if we take the real numbers as being an ordered field containing Q as a subfield, and we add on this axiom that in every set of these numbers that you take that is bounded above, whatever that means, has at least upper bound, that is sufficient to prescribe the real numbers. Now it turns out, as I previously told you before, if we were to construct the real numbers um, from the rational numbers, this axiom of completeness actually turns out to be a theorem, a consequence of our construction. So it is a really valid thing to do, but for the time being we're just going to take it as an assumption or an axiom, 
and then we're going to see what the consequences of assuming this are a little bit later once we've established a few definitions.